to some degree in some neighborhoods in Baghdad. Well, of course, there's 4,000 Americans that have died as well, 30,000 that have been wounded as well. Now, uh, you mentioned that uh, the battle in Basra was to take on the criminals and extremists. Aren't uh, we in there to battle Al Qaeda? Uh, Basra Center is a. Well, I understand how Basra is how Shia, complex. And Shia the, area and does not not have a Sunni. It has a small Sunni community, but has not traditionally had a. But we're over in Iraq presence. to take on Al Qaeda, and here we've got the Maliki government moving in uh, to battle. Uh, uh, intersectarian violence that's taking place, which many believe uh, can enhance the possibilities of civil war. Let me ask you a question. Um, were you at any meetings uh, with the Vice President or, Mr. or Ambassador Crocker where the issue of the Basra uh, invasion took place? Uh, it was not discussed. Uh, it wasn't discussed at, uh, at all during the Vice President's visit to Baghdad, uh, the, that the possibility of Maliki uh, going into uh, Basra was not discussed. You were not at any meetings uh, where the Vice President was pres present or where uh, this was uh, discussed in his presence. Um, it, it was uh, not discussed in any meeting I attended, no, sir. Uh, General? Same, Senator. Thank you. My time's up. Thank you so much, Senator Warner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> gentlemen, I commend you for your public service. And I mean that in a very sincere way. I've had the opportunity to meet with you and work with you in country and back here in the continental limits of the United States. I also want to say that I felt your statements were very informative and strong and clear. And uh, it reflects your own compassion for our forces and you added the civilians who are abroad, Mr. Ambassador, and their families here at home. And I should also like to add a word for all those thousands and thousands of Americans who are trying to care for the wounded and to provide compassion for their families. I want to go back to your statements and frame a simple question. General, you said uh, the following. With this approach, the security achievements of 2000 and 2008 can form a foundation for the gradual establishment of sustainable security in Iraq. This is not only important to the 27 million citizens of Iraq, it is also vitally important to the Gulf region, and then you added, parenthetically, to the citizens of the United States. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, you said the following. Americans have invested a great deal in Iraq in blood as well as treasure, and they have the right to ask whether it's worth it. I would hope that you could frame a short message at this moment, both of you, to the American people in response to the same question I asked of you last year, General. Is all this sacrifice bringing about a more secure America? Well, I've thought more than a bit about that, Senator, uh, since September. And though I continue to think it's a question perhaps best answered by folks with a broader view and ultimately will have to be answered by history, I obviously have thoughts on it and on the importance of achieving our objectives in Iraq. Iraq has entailed huge cost. Our men and women in uniform have made enormous sacrifices, over 4,000 of them the ultimate sacrifice. And the expenditure has been very substantial in numerous other respects, including the strain on the overall force and the opportunity cost in terms of not being able to focus more elsewhere. Having said that, there is no longer a ruthless dictator in Iraq who threatened and invaded his neighbors and who terrorized his own people. Beyond that, the seeds of a nascent democracy have been planted in an Arab country that was the cradle of civilization. And though the germination of those seeds has been anything but smooth, there has been growth. All of this, again, has come at great cost. I recognize that the overall weighing of the scales is more than difficult and believe it is best done at this point by someone up the chain with a broader perspective. Ultimately, it can only be answered by history once the outcome in Iraq has been determined. Having said all that, 
I believe the more important question at this point is how best to achieve our important interests in Iraq, interests that do have enormous implications. As I mentioned, for the safety and security of our country, 27 million Iraqis, the Mideast region, and the world. With, res with respect to al-Qaeda, the spread of sectarian conflict, Iranian influence, regional stability, and the global economy. I do believe we have made progress in important areas in Iraq over the past year. And I believe the recommendations Ambassador Crocker and I have provided are the best course to achieve what, what general, our important uh, objectives my, my time in Iraq. Clock is moving pretty quickly. It was a fairly simple question. Does that translate into a greater security for those of us at home? I point out this morning indications that up to 80 percent of the Americans just don't accept the premise at this point in time that it's worth it. Can you now just in simple language tell us, yes, it is worth it and it is making us safer here at home? Senator, I do believe it is worth it or I would not have, I guess, accepted. I mean, you know, you do what you're ordered to do, but you sometimes are asked uh, whether you would like to, to uh, or are willing to take on a task. And I took on the, the task of uh, the privilege of command of multinational force Iraq because I do believe that it is worth it and I do believe the interests there are of enormous importance again uh, to our country not just to the people of Iraq and the people of that region and the world. Mr. Ambassador, how do you answer it? Is it providing greater security here at home? Uh, sir, I'll try and answer that at uh, two levels. Um, First, uh, in the um, little over a year that I have been in Iraq, uh, we have seen a significant degradation of al-Qaeda's presence and its abilities. Um, Al-Qaeda is um, our mortal and strategic enemy. Um, so to the extent that al-Qaeda's capacities have been lessened in Iraq, and they have been significantly lessened, um, I do believe that makes America safer. The second level um, uh, at which I would try and answer that um, uh, uh, is that Iraq remains a work in progress. Um, I, I said in my statement that um, I believe that uh, there has been significant progress. Um, I believe that it is uh, worth uh, continuing our efforts there. And I believe very strongly um, that any alternative course of action to that that uh, we have laid out deserves the most careful scrutiny by the American people and their representatives because the consequences could be extremely grave. Let me uh, quickly ask a second question, if I may. Uh, on the Strategic Forces Agreement and Status of the Forces Agreement, both very important. And you said, and I took this note, the strong interest and benefits that flowed to Iraq. Are we utilizing this framework of negotiations to leverage a greater acceleration, a, a greater momentum by the Iraqi government towards achieving the basic goals, be they legislative or military? Uh, I think the, uh, the negotiations of the Strategic Framework Agreement, which is the, the broad agreement uh, that uh, covers political and economic and other aspects, uh, will be a, an opportunity to have that kind of discussion. Those, uh, those talks are not yet underway. We're awaiting the uh, uh, Iraqi decision on who their negotiators will be on that. But I certainly see that as an opportunity. To advance the reconciliation that is needed. We all recognize a military solution is not possible here. It's only through a political one. And I look upon these as an opportunity to say to the Iraqis, this is your chance. And we want a greater momentum towards political reconciliation. Can you tell us that that will try to be an element of the negotiations? Uh, it uh, certainly would be my intention to make it so in the context of the, str uh, the Strategic Framework Agreement. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Warner. Senator Lieberman. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman, General and Ambassador. Thank you for your extraordinary service uh, in the cause of freedom in Iraq. I, I must say that as I listen to your testimony, um, which is encouraging and yet quite 
realistic, and in my opinion, not overstated. You've told us that the strategy associated with the surge is working. Progress has been made, but it's entirely reversible. You've been very frank about some of the problems that we still face. I, with res I, I say what I'm about to say with respect to my colleagues who have consistently opposed our presence in Iraq. As I hear the questions and the statements today, and uh, it, it seems to me that there's a kind of uh, hear no progress in Iraq, see no progress in Iraq, and most of all, speak of no progress in Iraq. The fact is there has been progress in Iraq, thanks to extraordinary effort by the two of you and all those who serve under you on our behalf. I, I wish we could come to a point where we could have an agreement on the facts that you are presenting to us, the charts you've shown, the military progress, the extraordinary drop in ethno-sectarian violence, the drop in civilian deaths, the drop in American deaths, the, the, the very impressive political progress in Iraq since last September. Hey, let's be, let's be honest about this. The Iraqi political leadership has achieved a lot more political reconciliation and progress in September than the American political leadership has. So we've got to give some credit for that. I, I, I repeat, I wish we could have an agreement on the facts, which you've presented. You work for us. I don't distrust those facts, and I wish we could go from an agreement on those facts to figure out how we can move to more success so we can, can, we can bring more of our troops home. Uh, that's apparently not going to happen in the near future. I want to ask you a question about Iran, because both of you have spoken with great seriousness about the continuing Iranian threat. Senator Kennedy asked a question about the, the, Iraq, the Iraqi government initiative in southern Iraq and said there was no al-Qaeda there. There, there. As you said, General Petraeus, there is no al-Qaeda there. But there are Iranian-backed special forces that, from what you've told us today, continue to threaten what's our real goal in Iraq, which is not just to defeat al-Qaeda, it's to help stand up a self-governing, self-defending Iraqi government. So talk to us about, let me ask you first, are, are the Iranians still training and equipping uh, Iraqi extremists who are going back into Iraq and killing American soldiers? Uh, that is correct, Senator. In fact, we have detained uh, individuals, uh, four of the 16 so-called master trainers, for example, uh, are in our detention facility. Uh, you may recall that last year we detained the head of the special groups and also the deputy commander of Lebanese Hezbollah Department 2800, which is working with the Iranian Quds Force to train, equip, uh, fund, and, and also direct the special groups. Uh, the special groups' activities have, in fact, come out in greater relief uh, during the violence of, of recent weeks. Uh, it is they who have the uh, expertise to shoot rockets more accurately, uh, shoot mortars more accurately, uh, and to employ some of the more uh, advanced material, the explosively formed projectiles and the like, uh, that have not just killed our soldiers and Iraqi soldiers, but also have been used to assassinate uh, two southern governors in, in past months right. and two southern police chiefs. So they are a serious concern. Uh, I believe that this has brought out in greater relief for the Iraqi government as well, because they have conveyed directly to their Iranian interlocutors uh, their concerns about the activities uh, of the Quds Force with the special groups uh, and recognize the very clear threat that they present uh, to security in Iraq. Is, um, is it fair to say that the um, Iranian-backed special groups in Iraq are responsible for the murder of uh, hundreds of thousands, excuse me, hundreds of American soldiers and thousands of Iraqi soldiers and civilians? Uh, it, it certainly is. I, I do believe that is correct. Again, some of that also is uh, militia elements who have then subsequently right. been trained by these individuals. Uh, but there's no question about the threat that they pose uh, and, again, about the way that has been revealed more fully uh, in recent weeks. Ambassador Crocker, picking up on something General Petraeus uh, just said, 
though we all have questions about the recent Iraqi government initiative under Prime Minister Maliki's leadership in the South in Basra. Is it not possible that there's something very encouraging about that initiative, which is that it represents a decision by the Maliki government in Baghdad to not tolerate the Iranian-backed militias essentially running wild and trying to control the south of his country? Uh, Senator, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, as I look at the Basra operation, I, um, I look at it through a political lens, obviously more than I can a military. Right. Uh, General Petraeus has described uh, some of the uh, military's perspectives of that. The, the political ramifications, I think, are distinctly more positive because that is exactly um, the signal that uh, the operation has sent within Iraq um, and one would hope in the region um, that uh, this Iraqi government is prepared to go after uh, extremist militia elements, criminal elements of whatever sectarian uh, identity they may be. Um, I note, for example, that uh, Iraqi security forces are um, simultaneously engaged now in Basra against Iranian-backed Shia extremists, and they're engaged in Mosul uh, against uh, al-Qaeda and its Iraqi supporters. Um, um, and I think that is important. Uh, the reflection of that uh, has been seen in the uh, level of uh, political unity behind the prime minister. It says, uh, or more extensive than anything I've seen during my year there. Right. The, uh, the meeting of the political council of uh, national security on Saturday. And this brings together uh, the, the president, the two vice, vice presidents, the speaker, the two deputy speakers of uh, parliament, the prime minister, the deputy prime minister, and the heads of all major parliamentary blocs uh, unanimously developed a statement, a 15-point statement, uh, that included uh, support for the prime minister in these efforts. Um, um, uh, it called for the disarming of, uh, and an elimination of all militia elements. Um, and it had a strong message, uh, warning of outside interference uh, in Iraq's affairs. So I think these are all highly positive developments um, that um, uh, the uh, government can con continue to build on as it moves ahead with the other elements of the reconciliation agenda. Again, I, I can't predict that you know, this is taking us to a new level in Iraq, but it is, uh, from a political perspective, distinctly encouraging. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lieberman. Senator Inhofe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, several of us up here, all of us, feel uh, so strongly about the, the valor of our young troops. I, I will be attending a funeral at Arlington uh, at 3 o'clock today for uh, a Staff Sergeant, Christopher Hake, from Enid, Oklahoma. I uh, just gave a tribute to him on the floor, and, uh, and there's so many others who are, are truly heroes, and I, I think we need to keep repeating that and reminding ourselves of, uh, of, of the great service that they're performing. Let me just ask a couple questions on the detainee issue. I don't think that's come up yet. I, um, uh, I know that some of the far left are going to try to paint a picture that the United States of America and our troops are somehow brutal and torturing uh, detainees, and, and uh, I, I think this is something that is going to be coming back, and they're going to try to make people believe this, and yet it's not true. I recognize initially at Abu Ghraib there are some that did not perform well, uh, but after that, that act has been cleaned up. I, I just got back from, I think, my 14th trip in that area, but I, I was very careful to go to uh, Camp Cropper and Camp Buka. Uh, where the, these are the largest detainee facilities that are there. Uh, Lieutenant General Stone, I think, has done an outstanding job there, General Petraeus, and uh, he was good enough to let me have a free hand to go through both of these facilities. Um, uh, in doing so, I had an interpreter and actually had interviews with some of these detainees, Ask each, asking each one of them the question, have you ever been abused, mistreated, and all of this? And I got nothing but positive answers. In fact, uh, they're very, very positive toward us. I'd like to have you uh, make any comments you might make concerning 
the progress that's been made in the way that the detainees are, are treated. Well, Senator, there's been enormous uh, change for the better in the detainee facilities. Uh, one focus, in fact, was to conduct counterinsurgency operations in the detainee facilities. In other words, you cannot allow the irreconcilables to be with the reconcilables. You have to get the talk theory out of these large compounds, which you saw, of hundreds of uh, detainees and not allow them to proselytize, intimidate, uh, and to take out physical uh, abuse of their fellow detainees who don't willingly uh, go with them. And in fact, to, to avoid a situation where you have a training ground for the terrorist camp of 2008 or 2009. Uh, we separated the irreconcilables. We have now, we're now providing uh, education. There's always been good health care, uh, good food, and good conditions. Uh, and uh, also, in fact, to the point that there are over 100 who have actually requested to stay on in detention after their actual time was up, uh, after their reintegration review board, because they wanted to complete either job training or civilian education or uh, some of the religious training that is offered in these facilities. Uh, again, this has been an enormous change, and uh, General Stone and his team have done wonderful work in this regard. It has resulted, most importantly, in a recidivism rate, a return to buca or cropper, if you will, that is very, very small compared with what it used to be. And we track that because we have the biometrics on each of the individuals who have been in our facilities. So it's an enormous shift. It is something we are trying to capture in our doctrinal manuals uh, so that we can continue to build on this uh, and to perform detainee uh, operations in a much enhanced way over what was done before. Yeah, that was my observation. Uh, Ambassador Crocker, I, in your opening statement, uh, you, you referred to the, I believe, uh, Ahmadinejad making the statement that if something happens that the, uh, we leave precipitously, that uh, there would be a vacuum and he would fill that vacuum. Uh, you didn't take any much time after that to say what would happen. Either one you want to comment on uh, what would happen if they were to, uh, to, to fill that vacuum. I, uh, Senator, I think the uh, uh, developments in Baghdad and Basra uh, over the last couple of weeks have been very instructive on a number of levels. I um, commented on one of them in response to Senator Lieberman's question. Uh, it is also very important in what it shows us of um, what Iran is doing. Um, um, because the general level of violence is down, um, uh, we could see, I think, much more sharply defined uh, what Iran's role is in the arming and equipping of these extremist militia groups. And what it tells me is that um, uh, Iran is uh, pursuing as it were, a Lebanization um, a strategy, uh, uh, using the same techniques they used in Lebanon to uh, co-opt uh, elements of the uh, local Shia community um, and use them as basically instruments of um, uh, Iranian force. Um, that also tells me, sir, that um, uh, in the event of a uh, precipitous um, uh, U.S. withdrawal, the Iranians would just push that much harder. Yeah, uh, and they, they said they would do that. Yeah. Uh, 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 last question here. As you well know, the uh, down at Camp Buka, that's real close to Basra, where all this is taking place, and I was there right after that took place. I'm a little confused. There's a lot of criticism over the way they perform. The, according to our troops over there, they were real pleased that they came in when they did with their troops and, uh, and, and demonstrated very clearly that they're willing to take on that responsibility. Uh, I, uh, the, the impression I got from the troops over there is that the Iraqis did what they should do and they did it, uh, they performed very well. Uh, Sir, I, I don't want to under overstate the performance. However, the Iraqi people uh, down there by and large were grateful uh, for the action by mm -hmm. the Iraqi security forces, mm -hmm. by the decision uh, that Prime Minister Maliki took to, in fact, uh, confront uh, militia, criminals, gangs, whatever it might be. Uh, and in fact, as I mentioned, the operation is by no means complete. It, it is continuing. It continues to grow uh, on a much more deliberate basis 
uh, instead of the fairly the more rapid, sudden basis uh, in which it was started and where there was some faltering at the beginning, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, they now control the different ports, for example. They control some key areas through which smuggling uh, of weapons as well as other contraband used to go. Uh, and so, again, uh, I'm not surprised to hear that comment. Yeah, okay, my time's expired, but for the record, I'd like to uh, kind of get your opinion as to where we are right now in the uh, numbers, the sheer numbers of the Iraqi Security Forces. My understanding we're at about 140,000 now. We want to get up to around 190, but uh, maybe a status uh, in for the record. Be happy to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Inhofe. Senator Reid. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Petraeus, do you believe that the uh, Mahdi Ami, the jam, will voluntarily disband and disarm at the request of the Prime Minister? Uh, sir, some elements uh, of the Mahdi Army could be incorporated uh, into legitimate employment and other legitimate activities. Now, standing down at the direction of the Prime Minister uh, is something that would undoubtedly result in violence. However, as you may have seen recently, uh, Muqtad al-Sadr has said that uh, he would uh, stand down the force at the request of the Marjaiya, of the she senior Shia clerics uh, in Najaf. And we're, we're just going to have to see how that, that plays out in the, in the months ahead. But unless he is uh, instructed by the senior Shia uh, clergy, he would likely resist that, which would lead, in your words, to uh, accelerated violence uh, between the Shia within the Shia community? It, it depends, again, how it's done, Senator. Uh, and uh, if you can do this well, uh, gradually over time with uh, the force in the background that is capable of uh, taking out action and providing alternatives. The key well, here is actually providing some other means of livelihood. Uh, the same problem that, as you know, we had in, in a number of the different Sunni communities uh, what, that were in the grip of al-Qaeda. Well, after the attack in Basra, where the Prime Minister committed to destroy these elements, and then he had to withdraw, uh, I think this is less of an employment problem than an existential problem of the political survival of one or the other. And in those terms, unless there's a voluntary compliance by the, the Mahdi Ami, the alternative for violence seems to be quite significant. Let's assume that's the case. Will you participate with your military forces in supporting the First government? First of all, there, there is some voluntary uh, standing down already, Senator. Uh, and a number of the Sadr political leaders, in fact, have been engaging and do not want to, to bring the violence. I mean, everyone has, again, looked into the abyss and said, this is not, does not look good. Let's step back and let's see if there is some alternative uh, that can be followed. And, What's the and alternative? So, well, the alternative, again, is incorporation in the political process uh, and over time providing some uh, avenue for these uh, young men to, again, participate in the economy and so forth. And that has actually worked in a number of neighborhoods like West, it's, West Rashid and, and a I variety think, of southern communities. I think that's the same dilemma, and it's been a dilemma now for, for a year or more with respect to the CLC, the uh, the sons of Iraq, where they are still being paid by us and they're not being as assumed, at least 60,000 of them, into the uh, apparatus of the state of Iraq. Is that? Uh, over, actually, it's well over 20,000 now, Senator, and have been. 60,000 is have still been, not assumed. Uh, it's, it's over, it's, I believe it's over 90,000, actually, that are on the rolls right now. Uh, and that will either be transitioned uh, between 20 and 30 percent to the Iraqi security forces. Uh, and the issue there is one often of illiteracy uh, and or physical uh, disability. Uh, but over time, and then the Iraqi government has pledged funds, as I mentioned in my opening statement, to uh, retraining programs, to education programs, and to other job employment programs. So I can assume you are giving advice and the ambassador are giving advice to Maliki to go slow. Uh, to incorporate uh, the Mahdi Ami and into the um, economy and the political life of Iraq over many months. Is that the advice you're giving him, or are you giving him any advice at all? It, 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 that seems to be contradict what he tried to do in Basra. Uh, Basra did go much more suddenly than we expected, Senator. There's no, no two ways about it. Uh, and again, you, you heard, in fact, the uh, report is a good account. Uh, I think that... Uh, it is accurate to say that he thought perhaps it would be a bit more like when he went to Karbala back last year, 
uh, and the sheer presence and so forth would be adequate, and that was clearly not the case in Basra. Now, again, in Basra, what has to be done, and they have just announced, for example, uh, what is it, a hundred million dollar uh, program to begin addressing these kinds of issues, and again, to get some alternatives uh, to the young men down there to toting a gun on a street corner. Well, I, it seems to me that Basra illustrated uh, the ultimate conflict between Sada and Maliki and, and the, the elected government. That's a conflict they tried to resolve militarily. They failed because the military forces failed and because of people got very nervous about it was spinning out of control. But that ultimate conflict is still there. It's the existential conflict with respect to the Shia community. And uh, the potential violence, in my mind, is very real and will be engaged somehow, either on the sidelines watching or swept up in it. Let me switch to the ambassador for a moment. Mr. Ambassador, is the Mani Ami and, and the JAM uh, the only Shia organization that is receiving assistance, cooperation, uh, has significant contacts on a routine basis with the Iranians? Uh, I don't think so, Senator. There Who else might be having that kind of contact? If, if not military training, then a dialogue, uh, uh, money moving back and forth for other reasons? Uh, let me, uh, those are two different aspects, and I'll, I'll address them separately. Uh, there are other militia groups down in, um, in Basra, um, and a, a militia organization called um, Tharullah, the Vengeance of God, uh, 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 whose leader, incidentally, is now in detention, uh, they uh, 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 almost certainly get um, support from Iran, as does uh, something called Iraqi Hezbollah. Uh, that does not necessarily imply a connection to Lebanese Hezbollah, but again, an extremist militia. Uh, I Iran has the, um, uh, again, the, the tactic, uh, as we've seen in Lebanon, of, of supporting a number of different... Uh, Would that include the ISKI elements, BADA, uh, Brigade? I'd put that in the, in the, in the second uh, category. Um, uh, Iran has a dialogue with, again... Everyone, everyone in the Shia community. Right, and... And it's a mutual dialogue. And not just the Shia community. No. Um, um, uh, the, uh, uh, what has happened with the uh, Supreme Council and, and BADA um, is that they've basically gotten out uh, of the uh, overt militia business. It's now the Badr organization. Um, and uh, many of its elements did integrate with the uh, Iraqi security forces. Thank you, my time's expired. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Reed. Senator Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank both of you for your service. General Petraeus, I know that this is your third year in Iraq. Uh, you've given um, of your great abilities and uh, um, commitment uh, to our country because you were asked to serve and you've done so excellently and progress has been made. And when a year, a little over a year ago, you were um, confirmed here to go there, uh, I think there was a feeling that we needed to give General Petraeus a chance one more time. And the, the numbers um, show that uh, you have made extraordinary progress, it seems to me. I ask you at that time, when things looked rather grim, I ask you, did you believe that we had a realistic chance to be successful in Iraq? And you said you did, or you wouldn't, have, wouldn't take the job. Uh, after this period of time there now, a little over a year, uh, how would you evaluate our prospects for success today? Well, as I said, Senator, uh, in my statement, there are innumerable challenges uh, in Iraq in the way ahead, but I do believe that we have made progress, and I also believe that we can make further progress uh, if we are uh, in, able to move forward uh, as I recommended. Well, I, I just want to thank you for an extraordinary um, uh, demonstration of military leadership, and also I think we would share an affirmation of the American military who under difficult circumstances have performed so magnificently to see us move from a time when I think this country was deeply concerned about our prospects in Iraq to a period where we're seeing real progress. And I think we should listen to you about how to enhance that progress. Because this is the policy of the United States of America. 
It's a policy we voted on by three-fourths of both houses of Congress, and we're making progress towards success, and we need to listen to those who help get us there about how we can maintain it. Ambassador Crocker and, and General Petraeus, uh, I am curious about this activity, uh, the action in Basra in the south when Prime Minister Maliki uh, sent troops there. I uh, appreciate your comments uh, uh, to Senator Lieberman, Ambassador Crocker, about the, poss about the fact that there seems to be in that action a demonstration that the central government is willing to take on Shia extremists, even though they are a, at base a Shia-supported government. So they're taking on, in some sense, some of their own base support that many on this panel over the months have complained they're not willing to do. It seems to me that they did do that. Now, it does appear that they could have been more effective, perhaps, with better pl planning. But does this suggest uh, that a significant event has occurred. Is Prime Minister Maliki developing some confidence now? And is his government seeing itself as a national government of Iraq and is prepared to use military force uh, to defend the concept of the country of Iraq? Is that an important thing that's happened here? Ambassador Crocker, you want to? Uh, Senator, I, I believe it is. That, that certainly is the um, uh, reaction that we're seeing from Iraq's uh, political leadership. And uh, I, I was in intensive contact uh, with them during this period before our departure, as was General Petraeus. And uh, the, um, uh, the change in tone um, uh, from uh, other leaders toward uh, the prime minister and his government is is marked. Um, uh, they do see him as um, taking a uh, a strong stand uh, against uh, illegal elements without regard to their sectarian identity, and that has had enormous impact um, um, on uh, the Sunnis, on the Kurds, as well as uh, as well as other Shia. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty cautious about labeling defining moments um, or watersheds. Uh, in fact, I'm real cautious, and I certainly won't call what we've seen there that. That will be visible only in, um, in retrospect. But I, I, I do think it is important. General Petraeus, is there any, um, the American military is just magnificent in a after action reports, analyzing if they, what went wrong brutally, honestly, are the, did the, are the Iraqis uh, actually evaluating what they did in Basra? And uh, you think there's any uh, uh, prospects that they've learned from that? Uh, in fact, we've already run an after-action review, or they ran an after-action review, actually, in Baghdad, based on the actions in Baghdad at the same time. Uh, most of the participants in Basra are still uh, engaged in operations, and we will get to an after-action review with them, although we've done a macro-level one uh, obviously, with some pretty uh, basic conclusions uh, about uh, obviously the need for more deliberate setting of conditions, and that's the kind of approach that we take to set conditions, if you will, before you conduct an operation. Uh, and and those conditions in this case were not as deliberately set as they as they might have been. Finally, uh, with regard to Iranian influence, how would you describe? the situation in Basra, in the south, in the Shia community, uh, how was that influenced by Iran, and to what extent uh, has Iran been strengthened or weakened as a result of this military action? Well, the, the weaponry, uh, the bulk of the weaponry certainly uh, came from Iran Center. And again, they're very signature uh, items that you see uh, in the hands of uh, the special groups and of some of their uh, militia allies, uh, the explosively formed projectiles, 107 millimeter rockets, uh, and a variety of other items. And we have seen those uh, all repeatedly. Uh, I, as to Iran strengthening or not, I think, again, uh, this is still very much uh, ongoing. Uh, 
Iran at the end of the day clearly played a role in, in, in as a, an arbiter, if you will, for uh, talks among all of the different uh, parties to uh, that particular action. Uh, and whether that strengthened them or also made them realize that their actions have been destructive uh, in helping a country they want to succeed, presumably, the first Shia-led uh, democracy, uh, whether that, again, gives them a, a good sense or, again, causes them also to draw back, I think is very much in question right now. And an ambassador might have a, a view on that. Um, it, it's uh, not something I could really give a definitive response to, but I would point out um, some things that are important to watch. Um, uh, th the militia actions, by and large, were very unpopular uh, among Iraqis, and that is why the, um, uh, the Prime Minister has gotten such broad-based political support. Um, it is universally known or believed that the Iranians were behind them, so that unhappiness descends on them a bit, too. Um, uh, I think it, uh, one might look for um, a reconsideration in Tehran as to just where they want to go in Iraq, uh, because over the long term, as General Petraeus suggests, uh, their interests, uh, I think, are best served by the success of, um, of this state and this government. Uh, no country uh, other than Iraq itself suffered more under Saddam Hussein than did Iran. Uh, with that brutal eight-year war. So they, they, they should be thinking strategically. And the reaction to um, uh, their, uh, the militias they support, I, I would hope, would um, lead them to do that. I, I note the statement by the Iranian government today uh, actually condemning the indirect fire attacks on the international zone. Um, uh, again, not sure what to make of it at this point. Uh, but it, it does underscore that Iranian um, influence in Iraq, um, uh, uh, while malign and destabilizing as they pursue the policy I, I described earlier, um, uh, there are limits on them. Uh, Iraq is, uh, in its essence, as I said, an Arab nation. And Iraqi Shia, Arab Shia, died by the, the, literally the hundreds of thousands uh, in the um, Iran-Iraq war defending their Arab state of Iraq against um, um, an Iranian enemy. So uh, there are some constraints on Iran, and this would be an excellent time for them to reassess um, uh, what is ultimately in their own long-term interest. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sessions. Senator Akaka. Thank you very much, Ms. Mr. Chairman. General and, and, and ba Mr. Ambassador, I want to express my deep gratitude and appreciation for your service to our country and also that of our military personnel who have served so well there. Uh, General, the Army has been operating with a 15 to 12 deployment to home station ratio for some time now and uh, has indicated its desire to immediately shift to a one-to-one -one ratio and, if possible, to a one-to-two ratio. Part of the effort to achieve these numbers has been the increase in Army end strength. Uh, but these forces will not be available for deployment uh, for some time. In the near to medium term, especially if a decision is made to, to freeze uh, further troop withdrawals, the strain on equipment, on our forces, and on their families uh, as well will continue. Uh, my question to you, General, is, is it your understanding that that most of the soldiers who return for subsequent deployments to Iraq are getting about six months quality time with their families over a three, three and a half a year period. My expectation would have been that it would be more than that, Senator. There are, there's no question but that there are individuals who are in their third 
uh, tour in Iraq since it began. Uh, but they happen to be individuals that either stayed in a unit that did just cycle back through, did not go off to another assignment in the Army somewhere, didn't go off to a school or what have you. Um, again, the, the Army would be best, the one best to, to answer what the average dwell time is across the force. Uh, there's no, no question that certain individuals in certain units, if they have stayed in those units over time, have may now be on their third uh, tour in Iraq. And there's no question as well that a 15-month tour is very, very difficult uh, on a soldier and on a family. And as I mentioned, the strain on the force is something that I very much took into account uh, it, when I recommended the continuation of the, uh, the drawdown of the surge and uh, the way ahead as well. I, I might note that, that there is something very special to soldiers about doing what they are doing, however. The 3rd Infantry Division, uh, which is in Iraq right now on its third tour, you'll recall that it spearheaded the advance to Baghdad uh, in the very beginning in the liberation of Iraq uh, and is now back for its third tour. That division just uh, met its reenlistment goal for the entire year at about the half halfway mark in this fiscal year. Uh, so again, despite how much we are asking of uh, our young men and women in uniform, uh, they, are, they do recognize both the importance of what they're doing and I guess the, this, this very intangible of being a part of the brotherhood of the close fight, if you will, uh, which is truly unique and special. Uh, and they have continued to raise their right hand to volunteer. We are very concerned about one subset of the population, and that is the young captains of whom we've asked a great deal as well, uh, and that is one that the Army is looking very hard at. But, but again, I am, I'm personally keenly aware of this. I mean, I have actually, with respect, I've been deployed now for four and a half years since 2001 on operations alone, not mention training and other activities. And there's no question about the toll that it takes and the challenges that it presents, not just to the soldiers, but to their families. General, given, given uh, your perception of the security conditions in, in Iraq, uh, how long before you feel we will be able to, to meet the Army's desired uh, dwell ra ratio? Sir, again, I, that has to be a question for the Army. I'm not, I don't know the, their force generation uh, uh, plans, uh, what their projections are for the bringing on of additional brigade combat teams. Uh, I know that their initial goal is to, to try to get back to a 12-month deployment. I'd, I'd certainly support that. Again, they, they're the ones that are the, the generators of the force, though, so, uh, not me. General, as chairman of the Redness Subcommittee, I am especially uh, concerned that testimony from, com from combatant commanders outside of the U.S. Central Command indicate that uh, operations in Iraq are affecting the readiness of their forces to be able to both uh, train for and meet potential crises in their respective areas of operation. A recent deterioration of relations between North and South Korea highlight the increased risks borne by the United States. Should that situation continue to worsen to the point where military involvement is required? Additionally, the Commission on the National Guard and, uh, and Reserves testified that uh, due to the high operations tempo of our reserve forces, there is an, an quote, appalling gap, unquote, in readiness for homeland defense. Clearly, there is a widespread agreement in the Defense Department that this level of U.S. troop commitment is unsustainable. In your view, General, at what point must, must the military, in effect, hand over the majority of security responsibilities uh, to the Iraqis uh, so that the burden can be more equitably shared uh, between our two countries so that we can begin the reset of our forces that is so long overdue? Well, uh, Senator, as I mentioned in my opening statement, there are already many multiples of Iraqi security forces 
uh, serving in the Iraqi police, border police, uh, army, uh, small air force, navy, and so forth. Uh, and in fact, it is Iraqi security forces who are the cops on the beat, uh, who are uh, performing uh, a vast number of tasks. To be sure, uh, our forces still have uh, the unique capabilities uh, in certain areas when going against uh, Al Qaeda and other uh, extremist elements. And obviously, we have the enablers, if you will, uh, air support. Uh, and some logistical capabilities and others that the Iraqis do not yet have but are working on. Uh, in fact, one item during Basra was that their C-130 fleet ferried an awful lot of the supplies and casualties to and from uh, Baghdad and Basra. Uh, so again, they are gradually, slowly expanding. By the way, they want to buy U.S. C-130s uh, and have asked to be able to buy the C-130J uh, more quickly than and I think the original response has been that it would be available. So uh, they are already shouldering an enormous burden. Uh, it, it is being handed to them more all the time. Uh, but clearly, as we have seen, uh, they need assistance in a number of different areas. And, and that's what we are providing. Thank you for your responses, General. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Caucus. Senator Collins. Thank you. <coughs> General, four and a half years of deployment truly represents extraordinary sacrifice. And I want to begin my comments by thanking you and Ambassador Crocker for your service. It's been courageous. It's been extraordinary. General, for years this committee has heard that progress is being made in the training and equipping of Iraqi forces. Each year, military commanders come before us and they tell us that Iraqi troops are becoming more and more capable. Today, for example, you, you testified that the number of combat battalions capable of taking the lead in operations has grown to well over 100. Success always seems to be just around the corner when it comes to training and equipping of Iraqi forces. Yet, when put to the test, the Iraqi forces have performed very unevenly. And it's very disturbing to me to read the press reports that more than a 1,000 Iraqi soldiers refused to fight, fled, or abandoned their positions during the battle in Basra. Ultimately, as the ambassador has said this morning, the fate of Iraq is up to the Iraqi people. My concern is as long as we continue to take the lead in combat operations, rather than transitioning to more limited missions, the Iraqis are never going to step up to the plate and fight for their country. So my question to you is why should American troops continue to take the lead in combat operations at this point after years of training and equipping the Iraqi forces? after spending tens of billions of dollars training and equipping of Iraqi forces? Um, well, first of all, Senator, uh, in Basra, we did not take the lead. Uh, Basra is a province that is under Iraqi control. Uh, sovereign Iraqi prime minister made a decision uh, to confront a challenge. It was not just a political challenge. This is a militia a gang criminals who were threatening the population. Uh, and, uh, and then deployed forces very rapidly, frankly, more rapidly than we thought they could deploy. Over the course of a week, deployed the combat elements uh, of a division. Uh, and then they moved very rapidly into combat operations, again, or, uh, too rapidly, most likely, without setting all the proper conditions and so forth. Uh, but they were in the lead. Uh, we provided support. We did provide some uh, close air support, TAC helicopters. We augmented their C-130 fleet. Their helicopters are also 
uh, ferrying in and out of, uh, of Basra as well. Uh, but we clearly did provide a number of enablers. They do not yet have intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance platforms. They don't have counterfire radar. They don't have uh, a sufficiently uh, robust expeditionary logistics structure. They do now provide their own logistics at their own bases, uh, at their own police academies, and all the rest of that. But again, taking that the next step is doing it after you've deployed, again, the better part of a division's worth of combat forces, two brigades within about 36 hours of notification, another uh, later in that week. Uh, they are actually taking the lead in Anbar province in a number of different places. Again, there's a guiding hand there, but uh, one of the largest reductions uh, in the reduction of surge forces will come in Anbar, which you'll recall, of course, in the fall of uh, 2006 was assessed as, as lost. Uh, and then through the awakening, through the uh, combat operations, additional forces, and so forth, Iraqi as well as coalition, uh, over time uh, has become a province that is actually uh, relatively peaceful and, uh, and actually on the road toward uh, prosperity. Uh, again, it is a, it's a process rather than a light switch. Uh, and when the going has gotten tough or whether, where it requires more sophisticated uh, application of force, uh, we have have had to to help them out, um, but, a but, a, but over troops. over time, well, it's a thousand out of I don't know how many tens of thousands actually were there, uh, confronted by very very uh, tough uh, uh, militia uh, elements, and in fact, again, because of the position in the forces, where they were able to get overwhelmed by larger groups of the militia. Uh, put them put them into a, an untenable situation. So I'm not in the least bit apologizing for them, but uh, I do see the situation that they were confronted with because of the the, the speed with which they went into action uh, was a very very difficult one for any any troopers. Um, so again, what I would point to is that in other provinces where we have virtually no presence or perhaps a special forces uh, A team. Uh, Again, such as uh, uh, in uh, Karbala province, uh, in uh, Najaf, in uh, Hilla, uh, in Nasiriyah, and, and others in the south, where because of the operations in Basra, there were also uh, outbreaks of militia violence. Uh, in, in those areas, the Iraqis proved uh, equal to the task and, in fact, were able to maintain security. Uh, again, the same with le varying levels uh, in certain areas of, of Baghdad. Ambassador, in 2003, several of us proposed that the reconstruction aid to Iraq be structured as a loan rather than a grant. You may recall that debate. We didn't prevail. Now we look at $100 a barrel oil, an Iraqi budget that was predicated on $50 a $50 a barrel oil. And the Iraqis are, are clearly reaping a windfall from the higher oil prices. You mentioned that the era of our paying for major reconstruction is over, but we're continuing to pay the salaries of the sons of Iraq in many cases. We're continuing to pay for the training and equipping of Iraqi forces. I'm told that we're even continuing to pay for fuel within Iraq. Isn't it time for the Iraqis to start bearing more of those expenses, particularly in light of a windfall in revenues due to the high price of oil? Uh, Senator, it is, uh, and that is uh, something that uh, both General Petraeus and I are engaged on. Um, uh, we've had several discussions uh, with the Prime Minister, for example, on the importance or the need for uh, uh, the government of Iraq uh, to pick up the funding for employment projects, um, and uh, he agrees. Uh, so we're working out the ways to do this. Uh, I think what um, we've got to focus on in the period ahead is this kind of transitioning. Um, uh, and it'll be, like everything else in Iraq, a, a complex process. Um, um, uh, what have they got the capacity to do? How do they get the capacity to do it? Um, 
but I think that's clearly the direction not only should we move in, but that, that, we, uh, that we are moving in. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Collins. Uh, Senator Bill Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I've got a series of questions. Um, if I don't uh, finish them now, I will have an opportunity to continue this afternoon in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, and please understand my uh, comments, my, my questions. Uh, it is with a great deal of respect and deference to the two of you and appreciation for your service to our country. Now, I, I want to frame my questions within the context of a year ago, more than a year ago, because the whole idea was that you all presented to us was that the military surge would stabilize the situation so that then the environment would be created in order for us to have political reconciliation over there. Uh, indeed, January a year ago in 07, Secretary Gates said that he thought by March of 07, or about three months after he testified, he said that he would know whether or not the surge was working. Well, of course, that time came and went. And then one of the times that you were in front of us, General, I don't remember if it was in your confirmation or if it was one of the reports that you gave back to us, you testified that the surge was necessary for political reconciliation. Now, I heard some disturbing testimony last week in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee from two retired generals. One, retired Lieutenant General Odom, who said, and I quote, violence has been temporarily reduced, but today there is credible evidence that the political situation is far, is thus far more fragmented. And then he went on to talk about Basra and so forth. And then retired four-star General McCaffrey, in response to my question about what's your degree of optimism or pessimism, this is what he says, quote, it's a hell of a mess. I mean, you know, there's just no way about it. It's a $600 billion war, 34,000 killed and wounded. We've alienated most of the global population. The American people don't support the war. And the Iraqi government's dysfunctional. The Iraqi security forces are inadequate, ill-equipped, and we've got very little time. By the way, I'm not recommending that we come out of Iraq in a year or three, but that's what's going to happen. This thing is over. So the question is, how do we stage as we come out? And continuing, this is General McCaffrey, and you've got to, at some point, hit the Civil War in the direction of somebody who's more likely to govern Iraq effectively than the current incoherent, dysfunctional regime that's in power." End of quote. So I, I go back to the original predicate with which we talked about the surge. Has the political reconciliation happened? General? Well, as the ambassador laid out, uh, there has been agreement among the different political parties on a number of pieces of important reconciliation, uh, if you will, and, uh, laws that represent uh, reconciliation. Right. Uh, among them is, in fact, the, uh, the debethification reform. Uh, there's also the provincial uh, powers law. Uh, there is a pensions reform bill that is right. little noticed, but actually extends right. pension rights to tens of thousands of Iraqis who were shut out because of uh, debathification and that, other That's a step in the right direction. Now, the question is, have those laws been implemented? Uh, I believe that the pensions law is 
again, is in the process of being implemented. Again, debathification, again, they're collecting the uh, information for that. Uh, ha have those laws been implemented to the point that we can see in Iraq that there is this political reconciliation, which is the goal in the first place, coming back to over a year ago, of the surge? Uh, Senator, if I might, I, I noted in my testimony when I talked about these laws that um, uh, obviously how they are implemented is going to be key. Um, uh, the amnesty law, uh, part of that legislative package passed uh, in the middle of February, uh, is, uh, is being implemented. Um, uh, 24,000 applications for amnesty received and about 17,000 approved. Uh, um, that's actually moved out at uh, pretty impressive speed. Uh, uh, the provincial powers law uh, uh, comes into effect after the uh, forthcoming provincial elections. It's, it's prospective. It does not apply to uh, the current provincial councils. Um, uh, the uh, one important step it did foreshadow is um, uh, an electoral law to um, set the conditions for those elections uh, that is uh, actively being pursued uh, within the Council of Ministers, uh, and it's a process, incidentally, where we are involved at Iraqi government request, uh, as well as the UN, to help them get it right, particularly with respect uh, to um, uh, the, the role of women in these elections. So, you know, again, l a lot to be done, um, uh, Senator, but they have, A, passed the laws, and uh, 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 in, in several cases, particularly the amnesty law, we see them moving out uh, pretty rapidly. So you think we are moving toward political reconciliation? Uh, I, I, I think the various elements that I mentioned in my statement, both the national level legislation, the way parliament works, uh, because there was a lot of um, uh, cross-block horse trading going on uh, to particularly for that February package that had uh, gives and takes from all of the political groups, which, of course, um, in many respects are sectarian organized. Uh, that process, I find, is uh, as encouraging as, uh, as the result. So, yes, I think they're moving in the right direction. But, yes, I also believe they've got an awful lot more in front of them. I'll look forward to continuing this this afternoon. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Senator Graham. Uh, thank you, uh, both of you. Well done. Uh, you know, according to some, we should fire you, it sounds like, that everything is just really nothing good has happened in the last year, and this is a hopeless endeavor. Well, I beg to differ. Uh, if I could promote you to five stars, I would. And if I could, I don't know where to send you. You've been every bad place there is to go, so I'd send you to a good place. Ambassador Crocker, I cannot tell you how proud I am of both of you. And let's start this with uh, kind of a 30,000-foot assessment. The surge, General Petraeus, was a uh, corrective action. Is that fair to say? That, that's correct, Senator. The reason it was a corrective action is between the fall of Baghdad in January 2007, all of the trend lines were going in the wrong way. Economic stagnation, political stagnation, increased proliferation of violence. Therefore, something had to be done and that something was called the surge. Now, I would just ask uh, the American people and my colleagues to evaluate fairly from January 2007 to July 2008 and see what's happened. The challenges are real, but there are things that have happened in that moment and in that period of time that need to be understood as being beneficial to this country that came at a heavy price, and Al-Qaeda cannot stand the surge. If you put a list of people who wanted us to leave, the number one group would be Al-Qaeda because you've been kicking them all over Iraq. Now, the reason they came to Iraq is why, General Petraeus? Uh, that Al-Qaeda came to Iraq, sir? Yes. Uh, to establish a base in, in the heart of the, the Arab world, in the heart of the Mideast. Are they closer to their goal after the surge or further away? Uh, further away, Senator. Okay. What's the biz if you had to pick one thing to tell the American people that was the big biggest success of the surge, what would it be? 
uh, it, probably Anbar province and or just the general progress against Al Qaeda? Would it be the fact that Muslims tasted Al Qaeda life in Iraq and Iraqi Muslims joined with us to fight Al Qaeda? Uh, I think the, the shift in Sunni Arabs against Al Qaeda has been very, very significant. Uh, the rejection of the indiscriminate violence, uh, the extremist ideology, and really the, even the oppressive practices associated with Al Qaeda uh, is again a uh, very, very significant change. Is it fair to say that when Muslims will stand by us and fight against bin Laden, his agents and sympathizers, we're safer? Uh, absolutely. Um, Ambassador Crocker, what is Iran up to in Iraq? Uh, Senator, I, I described um, what I believe to be a, an effort at um, Lebanization um, through the backing of different militia groups. OK, let's stop there. Lebanon kicked Syria out a few years ago, and they tried to create a democracy, some form of democracy. Hezbollah, backed by Iran, had a say in that endeavor. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, sir. And they launched an attack from Lebanon against Israel at the time the United Nations was about to sanction Iran for their nuclear uh, endeavors. Is that correct? I believe so, sir. So is it fair to say that from an Iranian point of view, one of their biggest nightmares would be a functioning democracy in Lebanon, a functioning representative government in Iraq on their borders? Uh, certainly their behavior would um, indicate that that may be the case. Um, uh, you make an important point uh, because we, we, we look at Iraq uh, as a nation in, in its own terms. The region looks at it a little bit differently. Um, Iran and Syria have been cooperating um, over Lebanon since um, the early 1980s, uh, over a quarter of a century, they have worked together um, against, uh, against the Lebanese and against our interests. Um, they're, they're using that same partnership uh, in Iraq, in my view, uh, although the weights uh, are reversed, with Iran having the greater weight and Syria the lesser. But, but they, are, they are working in tandem together um, uh, against us and against a stable Iraqi state. If I can walk through what these laws mean to me, and this is just my opinion. Provincial elections in October are important to me because it means that the Sunnis understand that participating in representative government seems to be in their interest. Therefore, they're going to vote in October of 2008, and they boycotted it in 05. Is that correct? Uh, that's that's one of the reasons they're important, yes. Okay, so the Sunnis are going to come out and by the millions we, we anticipate to send representatives to Baghdad or to the provinces rather than sending bombs. Is that correct? Uh, I, I, that is what I would expect, yes. Okay, now the reason the surge has been successful to me, General Petraeus, is that the, the Anbar province has been liberated from al-Qaeda, but we've had a reduction in sectarian violence. Uh, is that true? Uh, that is true. Okay, now this breathing space that we've been urging to have happen by better security, from my opinion, has produced economic results not known before January 2007. Is that correct? The uh, economy is improving. Th that is correct. The Iraqis will be paying more over time to bear the burden of fighting for their freedom. That's correct. They will be uh, fighting more to bear the burden of their freedom. Is that correct? Correct. Is there any way Iraq could be a failed state and it not affect our national security? No, sir. What would happen if the policy of the United States began January 2007 to remove a brigade a month in Baghdad, I mean of Iraq? What would be the military consequences to such an endeavor in your opinion? If we announced as a nation we're going to withdraw a brigade out of Iraq every month? Sir, it, it clearly would depend on the conditions at that time. Uh, if the conditions were, were good and uh, quite good, then that might be doable. At this uh, point in time, does that not. seem to be a responsible position to take, given what you know about Iraq, to make that announcement now? Well, Senator, again, I have uh, advocated uh, conditions-based uh, reductions, uh, not a timetable. War is not a linear phenomenon. It's a, you know, this, it's a calculus, not arithmetic. And that is why, again, I have recommended uh, conditions-based reductions uh, following the, the completion of the surge forces drawdown. 
Senator Graham, thank you. Senator Ben Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Petraeus, Ambassador Crocker, first I thank you for your, your service and to say how proud I am of the American men and women who are serving uh, in the military uh, in Iraq and elsewhere around the world. Uh, I might add that as a proud Nebraskan, a proud American, I uh, witnessed uh, on one of the national news channels an American, Captain Logan Veith, uh, embedded with the uh, Iraqi army in Sadr City leading forth a challenge and doing a remarkable job. We're all proud of him and those who he represents as well. Um, in, in 2003, as, as Senator Collins mentioned, uh, Senator Bai and I and others uh, introduced legislation to require that at least part of the money that was going for reconstruction in that uh, supplemental be considered a loan forgivable to a grant uh, part of it alone, but part of it also alone to be forgivable to a grant if the rest of the countries would forgive the IOUs of Iraq that they held. Uh, the administration blocked it, even though it passed the Senate, uh, because they said that they were going to the donors conference and this would impair their ability to get the other countries that, as part of the coalition uh, to be donors. Well, it turned out to be a lenders conference in general because the others did loan the money. Now we have an opportunity to go back and look at what uh, 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 Secretary Wolfowitz said in 2003. He said we really ought to uh, be able to get our money back from Iraq because they're, they're, through their oil revenues, they're going to be able to pay for the war themselves, finance it themselves. That was re in re uh, reconstruction, not the war, but the reconstruction. Um, we, uh, we have uh, uh, your uh, comment, uh, Ambassador Crocker, that uh, they're in a position soon or something to be able to to take on that responsibility soon to me means now uh, what I think we should do is in this supplemental and I'll introduce legislation with others to be able to do this to to make any further reconstruction money alone purely and simply to be repaid not forgiven and any other money that is that has been appropriated but unspent to date uh, alone as well when Iraq is today on the basis of the $111 barrel oil and $3.25 and upwards uh, gas at the pump here in the United States, it just does not seem uh, responsible for us to continue to borrow from our grandchildren in China and other places around the world to be able to finance, in effect, what is their, uh, their future opportunity. It seems to me that now is the time. Uh, you also, Ambassador Crocker, said that you think that they should be doing this soon. Is, will there be a change in the thinking of the administration on this? Will they now support legislation uh, that could be worked out to, to make that now, make soon now uh, and into the future on, this, uh, on these future appropriations and past appropriations that are unspent? Uh, Senator, there, there is uh, very much um, a, a, an interest um, in moving the financing um, from us to the Iraqis. Well, I think uh, you answered my question, but, you know, there was an interest back in 2003 when uh, uh, Secretary Wolfowitz said that they ought to be able to uh, uh, finance uh, their own reconstruction. I, I'm trying to figure out whether soon can be now. Uh, uh, Senator, with respect to reconstruction, uh, soon basically is now. Uh, we, we are... In terms of a loan? In terms of uh, the United States no longer being involved in the physical reconstruction business. Um, uh, uh, well, we what about the money that's in the, uh, the current uh, supplemental uh, that uh, is there for reconstruction? Is that, is that structured as a loan? Uh, uh, sir, that, that is not... Uh, in, in my definition, it is not for reconstruction. Um, uh, these are for, um, for example, uh, some USAID programs that we think are very important to stabilization um, um, uh, in, in conjunction with the military's SERP spending. Uh, we uh, will move into immediate post-kinetic situations uh, uh, and get people going with, um, uh, with jobs and things like that. Well, then let's call it post-kinetic uh, uh, aid as well. Uh, it seems to me that if we're paying for what, what is not, let's say, military hardware, uh, because they're picking up more of the costs, uh, we ought to be looking at training, 
uh, costs that we're engaged in. I, I just think that there's a point in time, and it's now, when we need to find a way to make sure that Iraq is financing more of its own pre present and future rather than incurring those costs ourselves uh, by, when they're adding 50 to $60 billion to surplus at a time when we're developing hundreds of billions of dollars of deficit, it just doesn't make sense for us to be the financier of first uh, resort. Uh, uh, sir, I'm, as I said, I, I'm committed to that. Uh, at the same time, uh, I, I don't think uh, you have a, a one-size-fits-all situation here. Uh, a number of our programs, uh, particularly those that get down to the local level, uh, that our PRTs, for example, identify and execute, um, the, uh, the Iraqi government is really not going to be positioned to, to pick that up or even, even identify it. Um, well, I don't care whether they can do that. We can pay it, but let, how, whether, they can, whether they can get the money out of their treasury or not is secondary. If we can do it, we should do it, and then they should, they should uh, repay us. And what about the money that's already been appropriated but unspent? Will that now not be spent? Um, uh, the, uh, again, if you're talking about reconstruction, reconstruction. Uh, uh, you know, we're down to like the last two or three percent of the, um, uh, of the IRRF um, uh, projects. These are things that are underway that we're going to be bringing to completion. Well, I think there are billions and billions of dollars that would fall into that category. And for me, a billion dollars is not pencil dust. Um, uh, I understand the point, Senator. At the same time, again, these are projects that are underway. Um, I think we'd have to think very carefully if we want to risk a halt in ongoing uh, uh, completion while we try and negotiate with the Iraqis on... Uh, well, I think that's all well and good, but I wish we'd have thought more carefully earlier and got this set, such as back in 2003. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Senator Thune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Ambassador, thank you uh, very much for your extraordinary service to our country, and thank you for your very candid assessment of uh, how things are going. As always, you've been very forthright in your testimony, and we appreciate that because uh, I think it's important that um, we have a good understanding of, of uh, conditions as you understand them to be on the ground. And we make decisions <clears throat> on funding both on the military level and the other uh, benchmarks that we're trying to achieve with regard to economic and political progress in the in the uh, in the region. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you might be able to elaborate a little bit on the whole issue of um, the Shia militias and uh, the Iranian influence there. Seems to me, at least, that uh, a lot of our success these past several months has been the ceasefire that uh, the Mahdi army has observed. And I'm, I'm my question, I guess, gets at the point of whether or not Sadr really is control, in control or whether the Iranians are pulling the strings uh, there. And if we're going to continue to see uh, reduction in violence and, and um, a lessening of American casualties and civilian casualties there, that's going to be a big factor. And, and I guess uh, I'd, I'd be interested in knowing, General, what your impressions are about who really is in charge of these Shia militias and uh, the Mahdi army. Is it Saad or, or is it the, uh, the Iranians? Well, Senator, uh, let's go back to when the original ceasefire was put in place in August, and that was uh, directed by Muqtad al-Sadr. Uh, and it was because of violence that was precipitated in the holy city of Karbala uh, by militia elements that refused to surrender their weapons before going into the shrine area. Uh, that was, uh, did a great deal of damage to the reputation of the overall Sadr movement, which again is, is first and foremost a political movement. Uh, and then also has the associated uh, militia. Uh, added to that over time were connections between the militia and or the special groups, which are again these elements that are affiliated with or associated with the Sadr militia, but have been selected carefully uh, and then uh, typically uh, are paid for, trained by and armed by Iran, by the Quds Force in particular and which do take direction uh, from the Quds Force. Uh, the, the, the hand of Iran was very clear uh, in, in recent weeks. Uh, and again, uh, there was a recognition, we think, uh, in Iran, uh, based on people who talked to uh, some of the leaders there, 
that in fact what was transpiring was very damaging <clears throat> to not just to Iraq, not just in the, in the violence to the Iraqi people, uh, but and not just to the reputation of the militia, but also had uh, was backfiring on Iran itself. And in fact, I think it's arguably it did generate uh, a unification uh, in concern among Iraqi political leaders about Iranian activity in Iraq that was nowhere near as great, I would argue, uh, just a month or so ago. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, both of us have said that it sort of brought out in higher relief uh, the activities of Iran, of the Quds Force in particular, and its involvement uh, with these special groups and with the weapons and training uh, that they provided to them. Let me ask you, General, um, there have been some here who have talked about putting restrictions on or limiting funding for the Commander's Emergency Response Program. Could you describe that program and its value to uh, commanders in the field? Well, Senator, uh, as you know, a, a number of us at different times have, have stated that there's a point in operations where money becomes your most important ammunition. Uh, and typically it's small amounts of money at local levels where when you have all of a sudden the opportunity, because of security improvements, you can very rapidly commit it, again, in small amounts. Uh, we have also used it uh, to uh, fund the so-called Sons of Iraq. And as I had on the uh, one of the charts, uh, I think it's about $16 million a month is the payroll for those individuals on average. Uh, and I can tell you that the savings that we have had in vehicles not lost in areas where they used to be lost. There's an area south of Baghdad, southwest, that used to be called the Triangle of Death. Uh, that area has actually been very, very quiet over the course of the last six months since our forces and Iraqi forces uh, cleared of, uh, of Al Qaeda, and then Sons of Iraq stood up to help secure uh, local communities. Uh, it's a big reason why we have the enormous numbers of caches uh, being found. Most of them are, are being identified by, again, these local individuals uh, or by local citizens who have benefited from various projects done by the CERP program, have seen, therefore, the benefits of improved security and started to see some economic growth. And oftentimes, the pump is primed uh, with small amounts of SERP uh, very early in that process before the Iraqi government can reconnect to these communities, uh, get the different ministry activities out there helping them. It, by way, I might add, again, this is the reason that uh, Iraq has committed uh, some of its money, $300 million as, as its, its initial amount, uh, to fund something called Iraqi SERP. Uh, which will help enormously and can greatly expand uh, the impact of